African American legend series highlights the accomplishments of areas that blacks have succeeded in, and areas such as aviation, sports, music, literature, uh, politics. We will explore how African Americans have succeeded in those areas where they'd been previously excluded because of segregation, racism, and lack of opportunity. Today on African American Legends, we'll be talking with William Greaves, filmmaker, documentary filmmaker, Emmy Award filmmaker. And we'll be talking about the new documentary he's prepared on Ralph Bunch, as well as some of his previous work. Uh, Bill, welcome to African American Legends. Nice to be here, Roscoe. As a filmmaker, you're always coming up with new projects. Tell us how you came up with the Ralph Bunch idea, as well as some of the other ideas that you worked on. Well, you know, I've, as you know, I've always been, uh, I've been interested in documentary from uh, quite a uh, quite a long time ago. I started off in uh, or in the early 50s, actually making uh, documentaries. And um, before that, I was an actor on Broadway, mm -hmm. and I was in a play called uh, Lost in the Stars, mm -hmm. which was on South Africa. And uh, to that play came Ralph Bunch with Joe Halal Nehru and a number of other people, and they came backstage to meet the cast. T uh, Todd Duncan was the star. And um, I was fascinated by Bunch. Uh, you know, he was an interesting personality even then, and then he became progressively famous. So um, I've been doing films on a wide variety of subjects. Uh, uh, not all, necessarily not, all. Not necessarily, not necessarily on the black experience. Right. As a matter of mm -hmm. fact, most of them were not mm -hmm. on the black experience. But whenever I did get involved with films on the black experience, it usually was about black leadership, about outstanding African Americans, and, uh, Jackie Robinson and um, Frederick Douglass, and of course Ida B. Wells. Uh, we did a film on her uh, life uh, and her anti-lynching mm -hmm. crusade. Uh, uh, it was called Ida B. Wells' A Passion for Justice. but uh, And that's so important today is uh, we now have these various exhibits mm -hmm. about lynching, just how cruel and oppressive yeah. lynching was sure. and still is. Well, absolutely. And, but uh, you have uh, documented some of this mm -hmm. in your Ida B. Wells' Uh, that's documentary. Right. That's right. What is the title of it? It's called Ida B. Wells, A Passion for Justice, and Toni Morrison uh, does a marvelous job reading from her diaries. Well, let's take a moment and look at one of the clips from that. Okay. She was called by other black journalists the princess of the press. Some black leaders had a problem with her militancy because they felt she was rocking the boat. She was probably the most uncompromising black leader. She never backed down from anything. This was what opened my eyes to what lynching really was. An excuse to get rid of Negroes who were acquiring wealth and property and thus keep the race terrorized and keep the nigger down. Ida B. Wells, A Passion for Justice, next on The American Experience. Ida B. Wells was really quite a person. Oh, she was. She, uh, mm -hmm was a leader. Absolutely. Uh, in, in some ways, she was the first great black political leader. Absolutely. And she wrote well, yes. spoke well. Yes. And as you know, the anti-lynching le legislation never really passed Congress. No, no. Uh, it sort of subsumed in the civil rights legislation sure. now, sure. but it never really passed Congress, which yeah. says something about the depth of the racism in the society. Well, you know, it's very interesting because, <clears throat> speaking of Ralph Bunch, <clears throat> he um, was very much uh, against, uh, obviously, lynching, and he led a civil rights uh, movement mm -hmm. uh, in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. in the 1930s, um, using the students of Howard University to protest lynching, uh, the, you know, to criticize the Congress of the United States because it, it refused to pass an anti-lynching bill. And this was very interesting because one never, typically, one never associates Ralph Bunch with that with kind pro, of, with that type of, of militant uh, right. uh, civil rights, actually mm -hmm. human rights uh, activity, but he was really quite involved. Uh, what were the major influences on the life and the mm -hmm. career of Ralph Bunch. As a high school student in Dunbar High School in the 30s, 
I uh, heard oh. Ralph Bunch speak several times. Oh, did you? He would come to our high school oh. just as people like Mary McLeod Bethune and oh, yes. Du Bois and Robert Weaver sure. would come yeah. to encourage us in this great black high school to do better yeah. and to strive. Yes, absolutely. And we certainly admired Bunch. Yeah. Uh, he was somewhat of an enigma because he was in this uh, State Department. Uh, uh, government affairs sure. kind of thing, Absolutely. foreign policy. Absolutely. But he, we knew he was the first. Yeah. I, I like to say he was the Jackie Robinson of foreign policy. That's he, right. he broke the barrier. So what were some of the influences? I know he went to UCLA. Yeah. He was in California. Yes. Well, he, uh, he actually had a very interesting uh, uh, life, uh, his origins. Uh, he had a grandmother, for example, who was very, very involved with his becoming uh, fully educated. Uh, he, um, she was very much behind him in terms of uh, encouraging him to get a very good education. And uh, he uh, went on to excel as a student at, at uh, first of all, his high school, uh, Jefferson High School in, uh, in Los, Los Angeles. Angeles. Yeah, right. And then he went to UCLA. He got a scholarship to UCLA because he was the top of his class in, uh, uh, academically. At that time, there may have been five black people at UCLA. <laughs> Something like that. And um, he also was the top of his class at UCLA uh, academically and won a scholarship to uh, Harvard University. Uh, he was also a fine basketball player. Basketball, baseball, football. He uh, played on the championship team at UCLA. Uh, UCLA. He was a playmaker. Uh, he was uh, on the varsity, the first five. And uh, they won three successive championships, league championships, uh, while he uh, was on the team. Um, and uh, he, uh, he was a very, very well-rounded young man and very personable, and he managed to uh, succeed in virtually every activity that he mm -hmm. put his hands on. And of course, his major activity was scholarship. Uh, and that scholarship translated into his being very, very involved with various social, political, and of course, later on, international affairs. When he was at Harvard, was he active politically? Um, yes, to, to some degree, uh, but he, uh, you, would, you would have to say that he was largely involved with p political science proper. I mean, he studied uh, political science uh, at Harvard uh, government, it was called at the time. Did he have any particular mentor in poli sci? Uh, he, he had several mentors uh, who were very uh, much uh, involved with his scholarship. Uh, Melville Herskovitz was mm -hmm. one of them. And um, Hershke was one of the first to challenge this theory of white suprem supremacy. Exactly, exactly. And prior to Bun Bunch became an authority, the reigning authority, as a matter of fact, on Africa, uh, as a result of his uh, doctoral dissertation, which he did, uh, which um, uh, made him uh, very much uh, aware of the number of problems in the colonial world. Uh, that the Africans were confronting, and uh, he became a very uh, aggressively anti-colonialist. Uh, he was very much involved in uh, marshalling uh, interest on the part of the African American community in colonial issues. Uh, so he was uh, uh, he was you know quite a person in that regard. Did he do much in terms of the? Uh uh, previous uh, history of Africa before colonialism, the great African empires, Mali and Sangay and so on, uh, which sometimes uh, Africanists get into through anthropology. Sure. Sure. Uh, as a political science, yes. your scientist, given that colonialism was reigning yes. uh, in its heyday sure. when he went to college, sure. it's understandable he might have focused on that. But did he look at any of the pre-colonial African history. Well, yes, to some degree, he, uh, be, he you know, he did, as I said, uh, become involved with uh, uh, Melville Herskovitz mm -hmm. uh, on, uh, he wrote The Myth of the Negro Past, right. I believe. Um, and uh, prior to his going to Africa, he, he did do uh, research in that area. As a matter of fact, one of his very uh, close colleagues was a man named William Leo Hansberry, mm -hmm. who was the reigning 
authority on African history uh, in America, uh, in North America, as a matter of fact. Um, uh, so he, when he went to Africa, he was very much prepared to deal with the Africans as, as human beings as opposed to natives and, and that kind of When did of he thing. first go to Africa? He went to Africa about 1933. Mm -hmm. And uh, he went, uh, that was for his uh, doctoral dissertation. He went to Togo and Dahomey. And uh, he studied the, the uh, he was uh, working on the, uh, examining the comparison between uh, a League of Nations mandate system and a straight colonial uh, mm -hmm. situation, uh, which the, uh, the two countries uh, represented. And, um, his dissertation led him to the conclusion that there was very little difference between a colonial territory and uh, a League of Nations mandate. Tell us about that idea of the League of Nations mandate. What was that about? Well, the League of Nations, uh, at the end of the uh, First World War, there were the, the, the colonial empires, uh, colonial territories of the various um, uh, nations that were uh, the the Axis, the, the 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 nations that the West was uh, fighting against, um, and um, the the uh, the Americans and the uh, the uh, French and the British and the Belgians. Uh, uh, yes, they had these uh, protectorates protect of some sort. Protectorates right. and but the losers, the Germans mm -hmm. and the uh, Italians. Uh, uh, the the various other countries, uh, they did not, uh, they could not control, they could not have control because they were the, the losers. They could not have control of their colonial territories and they were turned in, over to the League of Nations as mandated territories. And those mandated territories were then assigned to like France or England and so on to administer. and. Um, it was in that context that Bunch did his doctoral mm -hmm. dissertation to study the mandated territories as opposed to the colonial territories that the uh, uh, British and the French. Uh, and that background must have helped him very much when mm -hmm. he got to dealing with the Middle East. Yes, it uh, did. Because, with Palestine. Sure, because he was very much uh, aware of the whole uh, mandate uh, system uh, which the Palestine represented, and he was uh, the most logical person, uh, as Dr. Rivlin uh, mentions, as a matter of fact. And, that's Dr. Uh, Rivlin of the uh, Ralph, Ralph Bunch Institute, Institute here at exactly. the Graduate Center of that's CUNY. Exactly. Uh, as he points out, uh, Bunch knew this whole area of mandates uh, and was a logical person to assist the mediator in Palestine, who's uh, Bernadotte, Count Folk Bernadotte, he assisted him uh, as uh, uh, the person who would be able to deal with the various problems that were presented by the two contending sides. There. But how did Bunch get a job at the State Department given the prejudice and segregation at that time? Well, the interesting thing there is that Bunch was the major authority on <clears throat> on Africa and America uh, at the time of the Second World War. He was a you know, militant anti-imperialist. Uh, he was a militant anti-fascist. And uh, of course, when the war uh, broke out, uh, the Rommel and the Germans were moving into North Africa. And Bunch, uh, being this authority, was asked by the OSS to be uh, the head of their African and colonial desk. And he came into the OSS and was stolen from the OSS by the State Department when they realized that he had this wealth of information and knowledge about colonialism. So he then worked at the State Department on the uh, setting up, the organizing of the United Nations. There was some resistance to his uh, joining the State Department within the State Department uh, and... Uh, Is that actually documented? Did, they, did it, you find it, letters or Oh yes, oh yes. Well, it's in, it's in our film. It's in our film. You, uh, you'll see a sequence in which Cordell 
Hull, the, the Secretary of State, uh, insisted that Bunch be uh, taken into the State Department. Over the objection of some of the lower people. That's right, department. exactly, exactly. Well, what were some of the major crises that Bunch faced in his work with the State Department and with the UN? Well, what would you think that his greatest crisis? Well, his greatest crisis, I guess, would have to be the Congo. Uh, it was a very, it was a very uh, a difficult situation uh, there. I mean, uh, Palestine also was, a, of course, a major crisis, and he won the Nobel Prize for his. Uh, developing the armistice agreement, the peace agreement. But if he's around and, now, yeah. since Palestine is still sure. Israel, Palestine, really, what do you think he would think? Well, I don't know. I mean, uh, you know, uh, the situation has changed so drastically mm -hmm. that I, I, it would be difficult to say today, you know, what exactly, how he would respond to that. Uh, and I'm certainly not I'm going to try to second well, guess. Of course, that's one of the hottest political issues today. Sure. But, Let's uh, take a moment yeah. and look at a piece of the documentary, okay. and then we'll come back and talk more about Ralph Bunch. Okay. He is Dr. Ralph Bunch, who only a few hours before was announced winner of the 1950 Nobel Peace Prize. First Negro ever to win the award, he is warmly congratulated. Nobelstiftelsen's Högtidsdag den 10 december 1950. I think Bunch is the only person I've ever heard of, at any rate, who actually tried to turn the Nobel Peace Prize down. Not the usual thing nowadays. He wrote a letter uh, to the Nobel Committee saying he greatly appreciated having been awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, but he couldn't accept it because he was a member of the UN Secretariat and he, his job was not competing for prizes, it was trying to get peace in the Middle East. And he felt it sort of distorted his function. And the Nobel Committee had never had a letter like this before. And so they got hold of Trigby Lee, who was a Norwegian, who was the Secretary General, and said, look here, this is absolutely terrible. I mean, there's somebody turning down the Peace Prize. This is absolutely outrageous. And Lee ordered Munch to accept it, saying, this is a prize to the United Nations. It's good for the organization. You cannot turn it down. We knew he deserved it, <laughs> because he had worked so hard for it. And he had sacrificed so much. I mean. He had been away from his family for so many weeks, working hard to bring about the four armistice agreements. And um, so we were, of course, elated. Um, you said that Ralph Bunch's major crisis was the Congo. Mm -hmm. uh, what was the basis of that crisis? Well, you know, <laughs> Africa's biggest problem is that it's uh, it's really the richest continent on earth i mean the the land mass of africa is just crawling with all kinds of uh, food fiber and timber resources and and uh, uh, mineral wealth uh, immense hydroelectric uh, potential there and so on and it is um, the irony is also uh, the poorest <laughs> of the mm -hmm. co uh, continents. And uh, one of the chief reasons is because of its immense wealth, that the, you have all of these forces and influences. Mainly colonial. Fund. Colonial, right. uh, vying for control of Africa's wealth. And in the middle of all that, of course, was, of course, the Congo. And uh, the Congo was the target of all kinds of, uh, of destabilizing and uh, uh, it, all sorts of intrigues. Yeah, the Belgians, the French. The Belgians, <laughs> the French, uh, the British. Uh, there, were, there were all kinds of uh, manipulations going on. And uh, Bunch had to deal with that. He also had to deal with the, the Africans themselves who were very new to statecraft and the like. Uh, and uh, diplomacy, and uh, it was very difficult because the Belgians were so repressive that, you know, they just, the Africans just wanted them out of there. Uh, but it wasn't as easily uh, uh, accomplished by just simply throwing the, the Belgians out. Uh, and uh, there was a lot of uh, 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 pressure there. Uh, and. Uh, Bunch had to try to mediate between 
the Belgians, the, the, the British, the Americans, the, the Africans. Uh, he, he had to... Yeah, how did he come out? Did, did his credibility suffer uh, through that activity? Yeah, to, to, to some degree because it was uh, generally perceived by some segments of the black community uh, that he uh, was not uh, in control of that situation. Uh, or that he was siding with the wrong side, but uh, that wasn't true. In point of fact, he was very much in, uh, responsible for uh, uh, putting uh, protection around Lumumba to prevent him from being assassinated. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, when he left the Congo, it was after he left the Congo that uh, Lumumba uh, unfortunately, was uh, assassinated. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, but Bunch, uh, uh, it was very a very difficult time for him in the Congo because he was already ill with diabetes and uh, other problems uh, with, with his health, and uh, he just the pressure became so intense that he just had to to to, to leave because he was not able to communicate with Lumumba. He was not able to get the kind of of, uh, of activities going there, which would have led to the Congo's uh, emergence, although he set it up in such a way that uh, when they left the Congo, the Congo was still uh, intact with a, a duly elected government. However, the conspiracies of the various uh, colonial powers began to operate and eventually destabilized and of course the, well, the United result, States had something to do with that the too. result the result uh, at one point the CIA was involved mm -hmm. with that as well at one point uh, at, they finally got uh, Mobutu mm -hmm. in, 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 in now uh, when he came back and oh, during his time the civil mm -hmm. rights movement was beginning to yeah. to blossom sure uh, he wasn't too much of a favorite of some of the civil rights activists. Yeah, you yeah. know, but you know that that was all unfortunate and not silly, but it was unfortunate. Uh, what was that due to? Well, the, what they didn't understand was what Bunch was doing in the United Nations. In point of fact, what they really didn't understand was that Bunch, through his work at the United Nations, I mean, he wrote the sections on the United Nations Charter dealing with decolonization. Mm -hmm. And he uh, was very much involved in the dismantling of the colonial empires all over the world. And it was through his work that there was a climate of acceptance uh, at, uh, of the uh, civil rights movement and also a lot of pressure coming from the newly independent states. But I was referring to here at the st in the states no, because what I, what I'm the African-Americans wanted uh, yeah, well, more clear activity on I this know, part. I know, but, you know, there's, there's more to civil rights oh, of course than, it is, than, but than I, I carrying a banner. Uh, he, he created the, the international climate and pressure on the United mm -hmm. States uh, that made it possible for a lot of the civil rights activity to take place without uh, uh, the with punitive with activity. Yeah, that's right. Place. Now, as we come to the cl uh, close of the program, tell us a little about the funding for this particular documentary mm -hmm. and how you expect it to be used. Well, the funding for the documentary comes uh, principally from the Ford Foundation. Uh, we also have uh, funds from the National Endowment for the Humanities, Corporation for Public Broadcasting, from uh, Camille and Bill Cosby, from the National Black Programming Co Consortium. Um, we uh, are, have also from uh, a number of smaller uh, uh, sources, um, and uh, they've been just absolutely fantastic with us and made it possible for us to, to do this film, which has been a very Now, the reason they wanted to do, to do this, and you yeah. wanted to do this, is that this is sort of a forgotten story. Is that the idea that you want to yes. bring the contributions of Ralph Bunch to light again? Exactly. Exactly. Well, this is the this is the central purpose of the film that it will go into schools and colleges uh, after its uh, public television uh, uh, release, uh, which will be in the uh, it will be in Black History Month in uh, nineteen or in 
2001. Of course, it'll yeah. be used yeah. uh, mm -hmm. for years and years after yeah. that. Yeah. Because uh, clearly Ralph Bunch was a pioneer. Absolutely. Uh, he raised some uh, similar questions yeah. about human rights. And as yes, you he said, worked very closely with, uh, with Eleanor Roosevelt, mm -hmm. very, very closely with her on the uh, Declaration of Human Rights. As a matter of fact, Bunch, uh, you know, uh, the thing that fascinated me about Bunch is the fact that uh, people uh, get very excited about various uh, athletes, uh, black athletes, uh, but he was, uh, he was a, a, not a physical athlete, although he was a physical athlete at one point, but he was really an intellectual athlete, uh, and I thought that was fascinating that he was able to be, in a sense, sort of the Michael Jordan of international <laughs> diplomacy. Uh, that, that was something interesting to me and uh, one of the central reasons why I was sort of attracted to it. Well, again, uh, we in the African-American intellectual community are very grateful to you for mm -hmm. your activities mm -hmm. in developing this documentary on Ralph Bunch. And I'm sure the audience will be looking for this documentary. It will be used in schools and colleges and churches all over the country. And Bill Grease, thanks for being with us on today's African American Legends. Well, thank you for having me, and I hope that you will uh, come to the uh, screening. Oh, we will. At, uh, we will definitely do okay. that. Okay. Thank you.